we're standing in Little Oklahoma, which is kind of a strange name for Columbus, and we're going to investigate how it came to be called that. What's kind of interesting about this area is it's so intimately tied with Southside Columbus. This is the area where people came to find work in Columbus. So we're going to be going on a little adventure through the neighborhood. We're going to see some of the sites that are here, and we're going to find out more about its history. I'm here with Robin Watson from the Far South Side Area Commission, and I'm hoping she's going to tell me a little bit more about this neighborhood. What are its joys and what are its challenges? Well, the joys of the neighborhood is that one, it is a very tight-knit neighborhood here. Okay. They are very resourceful people. There's not a lot of lines for assistance, things like that. Most of them are tradespeople. Some of the challenges are, I mean, this is a cloister community, but I think for a very good reason. If you go to High Street and you look north on 104, there is a sign that says, welcome to the south side of Columbus, where there can only be one south side. So if you're standing south of that, <laughs> are you still in the city of Columbus? Are you still a part of that? So it's kind of part identity too, and, yes. and recognition that you're here. Yes. Before this was community, was it mostly farmland as far as you know? Most of the far south side was. Okay. Story has it that this area was actually founded by people who were leaving the Dust Bowl. So that would put it in the 1930s then, right? It would. And do you know anyone uh, personally or families, uh, or is this a story that's been passed down? It's a story that's been passed down. I know a lot of residents that have lived here a while. Even from them, from longtime residents? Yes, I am. I wanted to find a resident who has lived here long enough that could help us find some Dust Bowl connection. I found Jack Seymour. When you were a kid, where did you go for ice cream or confectionaries or anything like that? Max's was our store. I knew you'd remember Max's something. Max's Scarberry <laughs> was our store. He ran a bill for people and you could pay him on Friday. He Just helped really old fashioned. He helped a lot of the families get through. Okay. And then there was another little one on the other side of Deering on the corner of Fornoff and 5th Street. Oh, okay. Have you heard the name Little Oklahoma? Yes, yes. We grew up here. Um, I have family on 7th Street. Okay. Um, my great-grandmother. She okay. lived in her 90s. Two big families is what I remember from them saying that, that were actually in the neighborhood okay. and started it. Great-granny, like I said, she was in her 90s. And that was the story she told you? Yeah. I'm meeting up with Angela O'Neill and Erin O'Donovan from the Columbus Metropolitan Library to see what the archives might say about Little Oklahoma. What we know about the Dust Bowl is that it's an area in the United States around the Oklahoma and the Texas Panhandle that experienced just a horrific drought between 1934 and 1937. Over two million people left that area of the country. About 10% of them went to California. The rest scattered all across the U.S. So it's plausible that some of those people could have ended up in Columbus. So what we wanted to do was take a look at the census and see if we can show that. This first batch of records is the census from 1930. Why we wanted to look at 1930 was mm -hmm. to show who was living here at that time before the Dust Bowl, mm -hmm. and then we want to look at 1940 to okay. see what's changed. So what we see in the 1930 census, it'll tell us the place of birth of the individual and both their parents. We see a lot of people um, from Ohio, some West Virginia folks here, some mm -hmm. Tennessee, there's even an Alabama. Lots of folks from Kentucky as we scroll through these pages. So we're really seeing a neighborhood um, that has a strong Appalachian influence and even a Southern influence. So we would expect to see with the Dust Bowl happening in that 1934 to 1937 time period, we'd expect in 1940 to see these people, but a lot of folks from that Oklahoma region as well. Okay. An interesting quirk of the census is that in the 1940 census, because there was so much movement happening around the United States at that time, mm -hmm. they added a question to the census. Oh. It asks, what was your residence on April 1st, 1935? Hmm. So that's the column where we mm -hmm. should see Oklahoma, mm -hmm. right? In this column, unfortunately, we see a whole list of people here listed as same place. We did find one person um, who was listed as born in Oklahoma, Cecil Sword, right here on the documents. Okay. Um, unfortunately though, because we have that question about where were you in 1935, right. he was in the same place. Okay. So he was in Columbus Already. in 1935. Okay. So other than that, um, 
not a lot of evidence for a, a significant movement of folks from Oklahoma directly from directly Oklahoma directly to. from Oklahoma to Ohio. The next piece of information which we do not have is the 1950 census. Mm -hmm. The 1950 census um, will come out in 2020 so we'll know the okay. answer then. The next step is to look at land records. Yeah, the first thing I wanted to find out about this little Oklahoma section is actually, what was it actually called? Uh, South High Gardens was actually platted in 1922 and it was uh, developed by a man named Roy Emerson Betts. My first natural reaction was, okay, it was the Betts family from Oklahoma, <laughs> right. the, the people who founded it. And I looked up the, the Betts family and I saw no Oklahoma connection there. Okay. Um, I also uh, saw a lot of places around the area were named after the Forna family. Right. Again, I wanted to see if that was an Oklahoma connection, and I did not see an Oklahoma connection there. I was looking at this family called the Marcos family who uh, owned a little uh, barbecue uh, restaurant, and just by chance I wanted to see, okay, where were they from? It says originally they were from Greece, which makes sense. The last name Marcos is Greek. And I was looking on there, and they said they've been in Ohio for a while. And when I was on Ancestry.com, it suggested a record for Peter Marcos that uh, there was a naturalization record from Oklahoma. And what I did is I pulled that record up and found his naturalization record in the year 1909. What I ended up doing was going to the city's directories. I did find his brother, Gus Marcos, was here in 1907, but I did not see Peter Marcos here until 1909, okay. which um, would have been after this naturalization. Yeah. Now, I'm not for certain if this is the same Peter Marcos, but it did take me aback because there was an Oklahoma connection right. out of the blue when I wasn't looking for it. So what we know about the Marcos family so far is that they're Greek in origin, but there seems to be some movement through Oklahoma, at least by one family member, and that they set up a little barbecue on South High. And the city directories that later becomes a confectionery store or a candy shop. Well, we may have found the Oklahoma connection. And nothing is definitive, but um, certainly the evidence is pointing more towards this story right. rather than the Dust Bowl story of right. the 1930s. Now that we have found a possible Oklahoma connection with the Marcos family, I've tracked down a descendant of Gus and Peter, Steve Marcos, and I'm meeting him at Shade's restaurant to learn more. My grandfather and great uncle came from Greece here in 1902. Uh, they moved to Indianapolis. They worked at the railroad for $5 a month, and uh, that was up through around 1905, 1906. And then in 1910, they opened this store with a man named John Stamatis. And he's pictured here with my grandfather and along with uh, a guy named of Anthony Zanettis, which was the founder of Anthony Thomas Candy Company. What a small world. This was my great uncle, and this was at that inside that building. So oh, wow. This was at the corner of Parkwood and East Broad Street, where East High School sits today. Then they settled down here in 1924. They settled in the, the big house that's across the street here. In 1925, this building was built. This building This building in. was here, the, the original part of it. These pictures are from around 1940 when they were making High Street from two lane to four lane. My great uncle was died in 1953, and in 1954, my dad opened up what uh, we called uh, Three Trees Drive-In, and then dad leased to a guy named Jack Shade. So, so it's been Shade since 1967. When did you hear that this was called Little Oklahoma? Well, you know, growing up, I, I had heard it. I mean, I've always known it was Little Oklahoma. I talked to a friend of a family friend named Milt Duco. He gave me the rundown about uh, how this became Little Oklahoma and the uh, people moving from the, the, uh, the, the, the Dust Bowl area. He was told that Columbus was known as the gateway to the east. So a lot of people came through this way and they uh, found work here and they found cheap housing. I asked Milt, you know, where he had learned this stuff and he said, well, you know, I said, I learned that from your dad. Wonderful. This is what we know so far. We have found one connection between a member of the Marcos family in Oklahoma, but we have not as yet seen a large migration of people from Oklahoma and the Dust Bowl into the South Side neighborhood known as Little Oklahoma. We know that the 1950 census will be released sometime in the future, and that might provide us with more answers. But in the meantime, it's important to keep hearing family stories to see what connections we can make. So if you happen to have stories about Little Oklahoma and would like to share them, please do so on Columbus Neighborhood's Facebook page.